2020 has been a challenging year for the global community. Coming out of the COVID pandemic, the expected exuberance did not materialize. Instead, many countries face food and energy insecurity, inflation and threats of recession. And Europe saw its largest armed conflict since World War II, when Russia invaded Ukraine. Meanwhile, deadly heat waves in India and China and floods across the globe remind us of the existential threat that is climate change. The leaders of the world's largest economies are gathering in paradise, but can they change the course of history? We have no other option. Our time of collaboration is badly needed to save the world. We all have responsibility, not only for our people, but also for the people of the world. War, inflation, climate change. Against this backdrop, leaders of the world's largest economies met in Bali for the G20 summit. Welcome to a special episode of Insight. I'm Genevieve Wu. With me today to talk about outcomes of this multilateral meeting are Charlotte Setiadi, Assistant Professor of Humanities at the Singapore Management University, Steve Wilford, Partner for Asia Pacific at Control Risks, and Sharon Xia, Coordinator and Senior Fellow at the ASEAN Studies Center, ISIS Yusuf Ishak Institute. Welcome all, thanks for joining me. Now, certainly one of the most anticipated meetings was between US President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping. Now, they had met on the sidelines of the summit uh, at the first face-to-face -face meeting since Biden became president. But let me pull back a little bit uh, for at COP27, when Biden had actually outlined his goal uh, before the meeting at, at the summit, uh, and I quote him, and his goal was to get a deeper understanding of C's priorities and concerns and lay out what each other's red lines are. So now that they have already met at Bali, what can we take away from their meeting earlier this week with regards to, I suppose, Biden's goal? Steve, kick it off. Okay, I mean, let, if we, let's look at the readout as, as, as summit watchers like to to call it, and I think that was very much uh, both sides, Biden and, and C, really trying to sort of put a ceiling on the, at least at a rhetorical level, on the, on the, on the escalating tensions between China and the United States. Mm -hmm. I think the big takeaway from, from, the, from, the, from the summit and that meeting is that was probably successfully accomplished. Okay, Sharon, what do you feel? It was quite interesting um, from the readouts again that uh, at the end, uh, the Chinese readout said about something about putting back the guardrails. Mm -hmm. And that was what Biden had talked about about a year ago, mm -hmm. putting in responsible guardrails, make sure that the relationship didn't veer off course. Mm -hmm. I think overall the meeting helped to bring temperatures down a little in Southeast Asia. We've all been very worried in the run up. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they, the two men knew each other when they were both uh, vice presidents, they've worked together before, but it's the first time that um, Biden's meeting C after the 20th Party Congress. Uh, so that's very significant for him to kind of get the sense of where C was going with his priorities. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, I, I, don't, I still think they're talking past each other on Taiwan and on Ukraine. There's, got, there's a lot more work to be done mm -hmm. than that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Charlotte, how do you feel? Yeah, I think um, uh, a lot of uh, leaders in Southeast Asia, a lot of observers would have breathed a sigh of relief. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was a thawing of the relationship, at least. Um, I think uh, C made it, made it clear about America not crossing the red line regarding Taiwan. Mm -hmm. America reiterated uh, its posi position regarding One China. Uh, they agreed to uh, 
you know, continue cooperating on um, issues such as climate change and the economy and all that. Um, I think an important takeaway that has also um, been a relief for um, a lot of people is uh, sees a statement that he was also worried about the use of nuclear arms, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, of course, is aimed directly at Putin and, and, and Russia's um, uh, war with Ukraine. So um, nothing much, I think, changed, but I think it was still, uh, uh, it achieved its diplomatic goals of, of having the two leaders met. Okay, picking up that, um, what are your thoughts that what has been achieved, or at this point, is it still too early to say? I think it's a little bit too early to say. Uh, we have seen some successful meetings, you know, for instance, between uh, Biden and Xi. Um, she also met Macron and also mm -hmm. Schultz as well. Um, although uh, we've also seen a little bit of drama so far, uh, you know, regarding uh, the Russian foreign minister. And of course, uh, the news just came in on the second day of the summit about, you know, Russian missiles uh, striking Poland, and uh, who's, of course, a NATO member. And, uh, you know, Lavrov, the foreign minister, ended up leaving Bali early, being replaced by the finance minister. So I think we've seen <laughs> a little bit of drama uh, already. Yeah, I think the proof is in the pudding, right? Yeah. Uh, so we'll see after this meeting whether they actually follow up. Um, they've pledged to maintain regular contact, mm -hmm. and I think Anthony Blinken's supposed to make a visit to China. Mm -hmm. So we'll see whether, whether more comes out of that. Mm -hmm. I, would, I, for one, would be looking forward to see them really open those channels of communication because right. we want to avoid any miscalculation and, and any accidental conflict happening? Well, I think, I mean, the, uh, the tone of the, of the, of, uh, the, 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 the Xi-Biden uh, meeting was an interesting counterpoint mm. to the f facts on the ground leading up to it. And, mm. those, and those facts included an extraordinarily wide-ranging set of, of export control measures imposed on, um, on the tech sector by the U United States. And obviously, uh, military exercises surrounding Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan earlier this year. So to really, I don't think we could have expected much more mm. than uh, a fairly convivial exchange mm. between the two leaders at this point. But, you know, there the were things given away by both sides. So I think it's important, as we've, as we've just discussed, to to remind ourselves that Biden made a, did make an effort to reiterate mm -hmm. the, 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 the strategic status quo mm -hmm. on Taiwan. And I think that was, that was in, in, important from a president who's actually, in, in earlier statements, been s somewhat moving, moving away from that position. So to bring it back front and center with, with Xi there, um, I think was a, was a, quite a, an interesting concession. Uh, yes, so uh, Pre uh, Biden did reiterate U.S. one China policy. Um, you, interesting, you said it is, is a concession. Is there a sense that that has placated Beijing for Biden to reiterate that after that whole kerfuffle with Pelosi landing in Taiwan in August, Charlotte? Yeah, I think so. I think um, I think it was a gesture, um, and I think it was yeah a, a, a concession, uh, a, a cooling mechanism. I okay. think from Biden to sort of de-escalate tensions, particularly after mm -hmm. the Pelosi meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I thought it was interesting that he did uh, reiterate it again. I actually didn't expect him to to mm. sort of um, give that concession, right. uh, but it does show that uh, he's willing to work together with his counterpart. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, we'll see. Hopefully, this uh, results in in actually having more open communication mm -hmm. uh, about this, and mm -hmm. perhaps China and certainly Xi um, is uh, a little bit more appeased um, that that Biden has mm -hmm. reiterated its one China policy. Right? Mm -hmm. Sure. I think it's important for Xi to hear from that Biden himself directly because all all this time throughout the year, he's been hearing what Biden's been saying through the press. And actually mm -hmm. hearing and reading the body language would be important for mm -hmm. Xi. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how important then, I suppose, was that face-to-face -face meeting? Like you said, picking up on, you know, all this has been through intermediaries or different mm -hmm. media. How important was it? I think in the area of diplomacy, just nothing can replace that physical face-to-face, -face, reading the body language and seeing where, where people actually stood. Mm -hmm. I mean, Zoom meetings and all, mm -hmm. well and good. It, it, for the purposes of, you know, expediency, but just being there in the same room, you can't replace that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Biden said 
I absolutely believe there need not be a new Cold War, right? Avoiding a new Cold War was something President Jokowi of Indonesia also raised in his speech. Do these words match reality, say, measured against the US chip export ban to China? We will. We, we, I mean, the, 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 the fact right, right now is we're not or, or anywhere near uh, a new Cold War. Um, you know, the uh, globalization isn't dead. Trade in, interdependence between the United mm. States and China. You know, when you look past the, the, the tech sector, uh, are, are, are profound and, and deep and likely to remain so for, for a, a long time to come. I think it's, an, it's important to, uh, to, to re reiterate that. Um, and equally, um, w given the, the context of a really nasty war in Central Europe, um, I think the ability of the United States and China and the EU as well to actually, to a certain extent, in quite subtle ways, often, but nevertheless true, co co collaborate on managing the, the, the scope of that conflict uh, to date, I think sort of underlines the fact that, that the Cold War is, is, is not, not a phrase we want to be mm. using too often. And I think it's mm. a perfectly true statement from Jokowi and, <laughs> and Biden uh, to, to, to remind their audiences of that. Okay, good. We'll hold that thought for now. While world leaders gathered in Bali, one leader was conspicuously absent, Russia's President Vladimir Putin. What does his absence mean? We'll talk more about that when we come back. If the war does not end, it will be difficult for the world to move forward. If the war does not end, it will be difficult for us to take responsibility for the future of current generation and future generations. Welcome back to a special edition of Insight. If the COVID pandemic was a black swan event, then Russia's invasion of Ukraine was probably the even darker shade of black. Now, President Jokowi had invited Vladimir Putin to the Bali summit, even though some members had insisted that Jokowi rescind that invitation. Now, it was only a couple of weeks ago that Putin had uh, confirmed that he would not be attending, citing security concerns, and he sent Sergei Lavrov, his foreign minister, instead. Um, what do we make of Putin's absence? Would his absence have made any difference? Sharon? I think it's definitely a relief on the host. <laughs> <laughs> if I was Jokowi, I'd also be like very much relieved that it was going to be an awkward point for, Absolutely right. for everybody yeah. there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting, you mentioned relief. How so? I think just Putin not being there at the table meant everyone could have candid conversations because as you know, everyone's been talking about how this is Putin's war. And everyone also knows in the room that you just cannot carry on indefinitely with this war happening in Ukraine. It's affecting the world's economy and, and affecting the way we're recovering from the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I agree entirely. Um, I mean, you know, Joko Widodo acted in good faith going yeah. to Moscow, mm -hmm. talking with Putin, pleading with him to come, and then, and then on, the, on the blackout train from Poland, to Kiev to, 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 to talk to Zelensky as well, to, to, to invite him too. Um, but the fact that Putin um, declined to appear, and I think that was actually driven by, quite frankly, some earlier public appearances in Central Asia um, at other summits where he, he'd really uh, copped a beating from, from, from other, other leaders. He didn't want that to happen again. Mm. Um, but the, the fact that he wasn't there, I think, um, as, as Sharon said, really created the space for uh, a, a less interrupted discussions about just how to get on with solving this dreadful conflict. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I guess like to pick up um, on what you were saying before about Joko Widodo, um, you know, um, 
I, you know, I think a lot of us don't envy uh, his position as host, right? Like this is perhaps the most difficult G20 yes. uh, to host so far, you know, follow, following the pandemic, the war in yes. Ukraine, um, and also the, the 20th Congress in, in China, where uh, she really consolidated his power mm. and got a lot of people um, really worried about where China's going. So, um, and also if we think about uh, Jokowi's um, domestic concerns as well, <laughs> Um, there, there are a lot of people in Indonesia that are also supportive of um, Russia uh, and, and, and what Putin's doing as well, because uh, Russia has been uh, viewed by uh, a lot of people in Indonesia as um, making a stand against a sort of more Western-dominated mm -hmm. uh, uh, world order, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think having Putin decide for himself that he wasn't going to come uh, would have been uh, a relief uh, for, for Joko Widodo to avoid all that awkwardness, both um, at a diplomatic level and also domestically too, I think. Mm. Does Putin's absence also provide relief specifically for China? Uh, yes. Um, of, of Xi Jinping would never admit to that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, and just going back to what you we were saying earlier about how in the closed-door meetings they could really get into quite detailed discussions about mm. uh, the Ukraine conflict and then leave the counterparties to reference Xi's comments in their public public statements, I think. Um, that would have been much more difficult to do with, 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 with Putin, uh, mm. Putin there. Mm. I would say also, a little bit more controversially, that, that probably the, the, the not having Vladimir uh, Zelensky there either, um, also created that 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 space for uh, for a bit of high politics around mm -hmm. around you know uh, solving the the Ukraine conflict. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now the world leaders at the G20 uh, agreed uh, to the point that today's era must not be of war. What do we make of this statement? Is there a sense that Russia is quickly running out of friends? I think that was actually a, shows how resolute they are mm. to want to end this conflict and it brings assurance to the people uh, of these countries, mm. right? I mean, we're all watching what's happening in, in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, it also does show that, yeah, no, in, in actual fact, no one is in support of the war, even if they may not say it. I think the countries mm. are quite well aware that n no one wants this to carry on. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. It's going to be tough okay. on all of us. But is it, do you think that is it just one of these what we call a motherhood statement, uh, that nothing really uh, actionable will, 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 will come out of it? No, I don't think so. I think it was, it's a recommitment mm. to mm. wanting to preserve the dividends, the peace dividends of, after World War II. Mm. All of us, you know, not to forget, even in Southeast Asia as well, we've enjoyed those peace dividends and we want them to continue. Mm -hmm. And I think like from the perspective of the diplomatic theater of it all, right? Like this kind of discourses are important, uh, even if nothing comes out of it. And even if, uh, you know, nobody says anything unpredictable, you know, it is uh, an important reiteration. Um, they're making uh, a stand that you know, a war like the war in Ukraine is bad for business. It's bad for pandemic recovery. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly the message that Joko Widodo is very keen mm -hmm. to uh, to project from, from this meeting, I think. And I think everybody's on the same page uh, mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. um, I think you only have to ask Vladimir Putin um, as to whether they were empty, empty words or, or not, because um, he's just escalated the war mm -hmm. in, in Ukraine. Now, of course, it's tenuous to, to speculate whether he launched 200 odd missiles into Ukraine in response to statements mm -hmm. coming out of the G20, but the coincidence is interesting, mm -hmm. shall we say. Um, and I think, um, I think it was Barack Obama actually who said, he, Vladimir Putin reminds him of a grumpy teenager at the back of the class. Mm -hmm. And I think the grumpy teenager has just reacted Mm -hmm. to to what's come out of the mm. the the the, uh, the the G20 um and it's not frankly speaking uh, 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 an act of strength mm -hmm. it's not it, you know it, it it is a it's a willful statement in a, in a, you know, to suggest that this doesn't mean anything to him but actually it really reflects the mm -hmm. the opposite um 
And I, th I think that's a, a, a very interesting. Yeah. Typically, we speak of superpower rivalries, right? What role do some of the non-aligned countries like Indonesia, for example, and next year's G20 chair, India, play in maintaining the world order? I think um, that that's a very interesting question. And I think um, oftentimes uh, the non-aligned countries, the middle countries, uh, doesn't seem like they um, have much say or much sway at all um, in the matter. But I think um, platforms like the G20 that we're seeing today um, does show that you know these kind of platforms can be used by countries like Indonesia, mm -hmm. like India, to make their position known um, and to try to influence the flow of global politics in what they can. Um, and I think certainly from the perspective of Joko Widodo and from the perspective yeah. of Indonesia, that's what they've been trying to do. Uh, and I think this is a continuation of um, the efforts that we've seen leaders like Joko Widodo have, mm -hmm. have been trying to do to try to you know, broker peace between Moscow and, and Kiev, for instance. So um, I think it, it has provided a platform for them to, to have a say in, in what can be uh, you know, very much a situation where you know, you're, you're an ant among the, um, among the elephants, yep. right? Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. The non-aligned movement's um, value kind of diminished mm. after the Cold War. Mm -hmm. and, but you know, it is like the silent majority in our electorates. Yes. Mm. They, they just stand together as a block. They don't say anything. And some, sometimes stubborn reticence actually moves things unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree with Charlotte and what, mm -hmm. what she said about you know, Indonesia and then maybe next year India mm -hmm. you know, playing that role and making some, some changes in that effect. Yeah, I, th I think um, the role of the, you know, the BRICS, the, the Brazil, South Africa, India, in Indonesia, uh, is profoundly important. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've already discussed just how how well Chico, Chico Widodo did at actually pulling this summit off. Yeah. One of the hardest, I think we'd agree, one of right. the hardest G20s, um, perhaps of all of them, arguably. Mm. I mean, having a communi communique mm -hmm. at all come out of come out of this summit, um, I think, is quite impressive, and that is down to the work of, mm -hmm. of, of, of those countries. Mm -hmm. And the th I think the third thing I would say is that, and going back to what Charlotte m mentioned about a lot of uh, the public in mm -hmm. the in the BRICS do not subscribe to this to mm -hmm. this sort of you know bipolar trope, mm -hmm. um, and and are skeptical about about European and and, and U.S. In, intentions in in uh, Eastern Europe. Um, and it's very important that you know these countries um, you, you know obviously um, look look to that and in mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a way bring that third voice to the to the table. Okay. Uh, speaking to Jokowi's uh, efforts, mm. right, at, at the G20, uh, him as a peacemaker, a broker of, of uh, peace, right, does the outcome of the summit diminish his aims to play a larger international role, given that both Putin and Zelensky uh, has failed to show? No, I think uh, I think actually uh, the efforts that he's put in, uh, particularly if we look at it from uh, the point of view of his domestic popularity, is, is more important actually than whether or not it resulted in anything meaningful, right? Mm -hmm. but, uh, because if we, for instance, look about, uh, at uh, the result of his visit to Moscow and to Kiev a few months ago, that didn't really result um, in, in anything much at all. But domestically, it was very popular. Mm -hmm. But... Um, I think we also need to think about uh, some of the motivations as to why Djokovic took on this uh, this uh, peacemaker role. Uh, you know, his main uh, intention in going to Moscow and Ukraine and in brokering, trying to broker a deal, is to um, make sure that grain supplies continue coming yeah. into Indonesia and the supply of fertilizers, for mm -hmm. instance, right? His main focus, as always, has been uh, very much developmentalist, very much mm -hmm. focused on making sure that business can flow uh, smoothly. Um, so in, in, in a way, uh, at least domestically, he's doing all the right things uh, at the moment. He's sort of hitting many birds with one stone. Uh, he's looking like he's the statement, statesman that Indonesian people can be proud of proud of, he's looking like he's trying to broker peace, and he's also looking like he's trying to get business on track and getting investments back into Indonesia. Okay. So I think overall, uh, his efforts have been quite a triumph for Jokowi. Can I just add that regionally, he's also playing a, a much bigger role than we expected early in his term, and that's really good. 
Um, well, at least within ASEAN, the rest of us do look to Indonesia to show that kind of you know, transformational leadership. And we'll be looking forward to 2023 when Indonesia takes on the ASEAN Chairmanship. All right. On that note, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the subsequent international boycotts have led to an energy crisis in Europe and elsewhere in the world. Next up, we're going to talk about another key pillar of the G20 summit, energy transition. You're watching a special edition of Insight. Let's turn our attention now to sustainable energy transition, which is one of the key pillars of Bali uh, G20 Summit. Now, one of the biggest obstacles to energy uh, uh, transition uh, that was covered in COP27 was this uh, $100 billion annual pledge by rich nations to commit to poor nations. It has not materialized. The deadline is 2023. How realistic are we towards moving this deadline? And can leaders of the G20 push it along? I'm pessimistic that we will ever see the $100 billion. But climate, the, the idea of you know, addressing climate injustice it has to be met. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really important if you want to you know, bring countries over to your side of the fence, right? Mm -hmm. Just, like Jerry Maguire said, show me the money. Mm -hmm. And my institute has done a study and we found that, you know, we've followed the money trail into Southeast Asia and we mm -hmm. found that actually majority of what has been pledged to this region is in the form of debt instruments, mm -hmm. not outright grants, mm -hmm. which means that governments would be, you know, reluctant to take on more debt to counter the climate threat because they already have to recover from the pandemic. Steve, what do you think? Summits like G20, this one in particular, can it move the needle? No. But it can create the conditions, I think, um, for other instruments to move the needle. Okay. And by that, I mean, so I mean to go back to Sharon's scepticism about grants and, and debt instruments, I share it, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, but I'm less sceptical about um, uh, governments leaning on their on their own commercial bodies to really, really rev up the transition to. To, to greener energy. So I think if you look at the, at the commercial space mm. um, and the amount of investment um, into the green transition that's happening um, already in Southeast Asia and will, will, only, will only increase over time, I think the regulatory pressure that the EU mm. is going to put on it, or put on itself, um, is going to feed right back down supply chains coming, mm. coming out of Asia. And that's really going to I think the best word to use is revolutionise mm -hmm. just how uh, companies um, and governments in this in this region deal mm -hmm. deal with the the green agenda. I think that is a real thing, and I think mm -hmm. G twenty um, is is a, is be like a, a sounding board. And the reason why I'm not optimistic in that in that area is because constituencies globally really care about this thing now. It's going to lose people power, whether they are running a, a, a liberal democracy or even, you know, running a country through more authoritarian levers like perhaps China. Mm -hmm. It matters in both of those places. Mm -hmm. And leaders from both of those types of, of jurisdiction are deeply worried about the, the implications for them as, as, as leaders of this. But despite, I suppose, the deep worries, what we're talking about, there is still a divide among world leaders on how to move forward. Coming out of COP27, uh, the, G, the rich polluters need to do more, I suppose, in carrying the weight uh, of, of moving forward. Do you see this tension being carried into G20 Summit? Yeah, I think so. I think the divide that have been there for a long time between uh, the demands by developed countries uh, for developing countries to also uh, better regulate their carbon emissions in order to transition into sustainable energy um, and the de developing countries um, putting up resistance because of their own developmentalist agenda, uh, that's something that's still there, mm -hmm. uh, I think. And I don't know uh, how much the, a summit like G20 is going to um, 
relieve that tension uh, that exists. Um, and certainly, um, I think the, the kind of vague language that we uh, see coming out of summits like G20 about, about these kind of matters show uh, that this is not something that is being resolved. Yes. Uh, but, you know, this is uh, still important to have these kinds of issues being talked about in G20 because it shows an ongoing commitment, at mm -hmm. least, um, and, and an ongoing goodwill, if not any concrete action or measures mm -hmm. uh, right now. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of disproportionality in the way that um, countries are responding. First, mm -hmm. the Global South, they suffer mm -hmm. disproportionately from the impacts yes. of climate change. Extreme weather events you've seen in Pakistan, across the world, in India, in, in even in Australia, and parts of Southeast Asia, flooding and so on. And the second is that we've historically not been the largest emitters. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. why should we have to bear the brunt? Mm -hmm. And the developed countries are resisting it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've come to a point where we have to admit we cannot go on anymore saying that we'll adapt. We have to address and we have to uh, make sure that countries get compensation mm -hmm. for it. And some of the losses are just irreversible. You can't mm -hmm. take it back. Right, let's talk about partnerships then, right? At the G20 summit, President Jokowi and leaders of the International Partners Group, IPG, uh, including the US, Japan, EU and others, issued a joint statement now committing Indonesia to reach peak emissions by 2030 and net zero by 2050. Now, how important are such international partnerships? Well, I think that brings Indonesia's ambition forward by 10 years, from 2060 to 2050. And that's good, just going back to the classroom analogy. This is putting pressure on each other to, you know, reach the finishing line faster. Mm -hmm. But I guess, like, you know, the, the joint statement can say whatever it wants, right? Like, whether or not... Um, countries like Indonesia, or in this case specifically Indonesia, can, can achieve it is a different issue, right? You know, the big irony of the G20 summit at the moment in Bali is that it's actually being powered by a coal power uh, station, something that, of course, the organizers are, are very sensitive about. <laughs> so, you know, again, I think that this reflects that discrepancy that we were talking about, right, between the developed countries and the developing countries of the global south um, and, and the pressure for the developing countries to meet these, you know, quite unrealistic goals. Uh, they're very important goals, and it's important to reiterate them in diplomatic platforms such as this. But whether or not it will be achieved, I think, is a different question. They will need help, uh, very likely. And all of them have stated so in the NDCs that they need international. It's all conditioned on assistance. You know, that's the, 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 the crucial point. You, you bring your, your targets forward, as Indonesia has done, uh, and partners sign up to that. It actually allows Indonesia to, to start building a shopping list of mm. what the country needs to do to get to net zero and the sort of commercial um, targets that it, it, it needs to hit in terms of new technology, new power stations, mm. so on and so forth. And that's actually quite powerful. That can be pushed back across the table at, um, at the leading emitters and, 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 they can, and they can say, yeah, you want, us to, you want us to do it 10 years sooner? This mm. is the tech that we're going to need to do it. And I think that is useful. Again, show me the money, right? Yeah. Show me the show money. Me <laughs> now, one of the key uh, visions and goals of G20 was what does a post-pandemic world look like? We'll talk more about that when we return. Thanks for staying with us. You're watching a special episode of Insight. As the world comes out of a pandemic, the theme of the Bali Summit is Recover Together, Recover Stronger. In his keynote address, Jokowi talked about collaboration. Has the G20 meetings and discussions given you confidence that we can do this? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it is more than anything else, perhaps reassuring to see um, a, you know, this, this group of world leaders um, at least seeming like they're agreeing um, at, um, at, at something. And I think it's particularly for market watchers, particularly for um, you know, those who are nervous about the direction of the Ukraine war and, 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 the, and the greater polarization that we see between countries, um, it is, it is Theater, but I think it is still an important one, uh, particularly if we think about the importance of, you know, continuing multilateralism in, in, in the future. Mm -hmm.
I mean, in, in my work, I'm actually fascinated by the role of sort of emotion in in politics and, and regulation and how that can move markets and how it can mm. can lead to quite unexpected things. Whereas in it's superficially nothing <laughs> substantial has actually really happened. And I think this G20 is what is is one of those. You know, there's, it's been a reiteration yeah. mm. on a superficial level of of things that every, the world already knows about, mm. already yeah. uh, has already seen, as stated by, for example, China and the United States. Right. But if you look at the sentiment of this of this summit, I think it was a real collective effort to sort of bring you know, multilateralism back into back into play. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that you know, there might not be anything particularly tangible mm -hmm. about that, but I think it does, it, it does perhaps mark a, a, a fork in the road in terms, mm -hmm. of, in terms of how the top 20 economies are going to try and interact with each other going forward. Okay. On the note of uh, economies, this is what G20 is about, there is a sense that globalisation was reversed by the pandemic. Uh, Singapore's Deputy Prime Minister, Lawrence Wong, in September said that the golden age of globalisation is over. What threats to globalisation do we see? Is G20 about restarting uh, that globalisation or are we looking at a different form altogether? Actually, there's discussions about how we're seeing trends of de-globalisation. And in the run-up to the G20, there were all this chatter about decoupling uh, the US and China economies. Okay. The US putting out its CHIPS Act and all kinds of export controls measures were put in place. And that was, I'm sure, making commercial companies very nervous and jittery about yeah. doing the wrong thing and not doing the right thing. And that is not uh, healthy, actually, because to be realistic, you cannot decouple mm -hmm. from each other. You can reduce dependencies. But decoupling in the real world, not possible. You know, the very fact, I think, now that uh, you have market watchers, you have, uh, you know, different, different groups of people looking at what's being talked about in the G20 summit and talking about, you know, issues such as how the war in Ukraine is going to um, influence you know, market supply and, and how it's influencing global economy and the price of crude oil, all these sort of stuff um, shows us that, you know, we're very far away, I think, from uh, deglobalization and perhaps even more so important now as we're trying to recover from the pandemic uh, with the global inflation yeah. uh, looming. Um, and it's important both for domestic politics, for all of the countries involved, as what it is for international cooperation, I think. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. right. We forget how interdependent we are and how, how connected we've become, you know, in, mm -hmm. in the last few decades you know working together mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think we we're, we're staring down the the barrel of a global recession in mm -hmm. in 2022 i think for us in in asia we are maybe even i dare i say it's being slightly complacent about this given you know mm -hmm. just how well the region uh came out of uh of covid um, but it just underlines that I, th I think we'll, we will really feel globalization, if you like, the negative side of it, in in the fourth in the forthcoming year, because mm -hmm. that the th these issues around inflation, you know, around uh, difficulties in s supply chain, around the implications for all of us globally of war in Ukraine, are really going to start to be felt mm -hmm. in the in the year ahead. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, to go to, long, to, go to your, 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 your point about Lawrence Wong's statement about, um, about globalisation, I'd possibly finesse it a little bit and say we, we might well have reached peak mm -hmm. globali globalisation. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's no doubt that the United States is in a real protectionist mood, notwithstanding yeah. Biden's comments at the G20. Mm -hmm. Facts on the ground suggest that, you, mm -hmm. you know, um, the United States, and this is worrying for the Europeans as well as as as, as China. Yes. Um, that we, we, you know, we, 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 I think we've seen a plateauing out of of, of, of globalization. Mm -hmm. Other issues that plague the world right now are, of course, we're talking about inflation and food security. Now, from the reports coming out of the G20, does any of it give you confidence that these issues were constructively addressed at the summit? I think one of the initiatives is a package that will allow the export of grains um, from Ukraine 
at, at, that's brokered by the UN and Turkey. And I'm hopeful that uh, with that, we will be seeing you know, the transportation of foodstuff, fertilizers, and grains uh, out of that region into the world and might ease up. Uh, mm -hmm. some of the fears that we have right. in supplies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, Putin's stop-go position on you know, the grain supplies out of the, out of the Ukraine, I think it's going to continue to be used as a, a weapon of, sure. of war, uh, and unfortunately, with, with the, 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 the debilitating consequences of that in, in emerging markets. Mm -hmm. I guess, like, the one thing uh, that Joko Widodo has been criticized for in regards to his opening speech uh, about where he, you're talking about, you know, uh, a meeting like G20 uh, as being a platform where countries can talk about renewable energy sources and sustainability and sustainable practices, yet in the next sentence, he started talking about getting fertilizers back, um, you know, and, and making sure that there's a global supply for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think um, it has also highlighted some of the competing mm -hmm. um, goals and, mm -hmm. and how some of these goals that the G20 summit is trying to achieve now is perhaps very difficult to reconcile. You can't achieve all of it in, in equal measure. So on that note, uh, this question is for each of you and every one of you. What is your single biggest takeaway from the G20 summit? I'm an analyst of Indonesian politics, so uh, I'm going to answer your question from the perspective of Indonesia as the host and, and, and uh, from the perspective of domestic politics. I think, uh, to reiterate what we were talking about before, uh, I think it shows uh, that platforms like the G20 can be uh, a space where uh, non-aligned countries and uh, middle countries such as Indonesia can play a part in the global stage. And certainly if we look at it from um, Indonesia's uh, pride in hosting G20, it's been very, very popular uh, domestically. It has boosted uh, President Joko Widodo's uh, popularity. Uh, so it can, uh, the, one of the biggest takeaways for me has been how um, diplomatic events such as this and uh, how it can be used as a showcase of um, power, of, of wealth, of, of, uh, of uh, the competency of a, of a president uh, and of an administration, how uh, it, can, it can also boost domestic politics. Uh, so for me, that has been the, the, the takeaway from an Indonesian politics perspective. Yeah, I think that at least it's not the G19. We had the G20. And that's definitely a good sign. It's not a magic switch where, you know, tomorrow we wake up and all is good and well, we're on the way to recovery, but it's a start. And I think meetings like these sorts actually, you know, it revives multilateralism. It brings us back to talking to each other, to cooperating with each other. All of that kind of went under the radar when we were going through the pandemic. And so unfortunately, the G20 has been a little bit overshadowed by the C. Biden meeting. Uh, but in that regard, it's been quite positive vibes coming out of that meeting. And I, I think that's put everyone a little bit at ease with regard to what the two countries think about each other and how they're going to move this forward with each other. I think the, as somebody who deals with, um, with, with a lot of uh, business leaders, uh, what, a, what a busy week geopolitically it's been, you know, not just G20, but the climate change conference, COP27, and then other potentially major events like Donald Trump's declaration of uh, running for the presidency. You know, all these things are combining, and they and they really resonate with 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 business leaders in terms of how how they're going to deal with their regional strategies, their global strategies, in a way that is arguably quite new. This kind of stuff didn't really matter that much to a lot of a lot of CEOs maybe even five as, as, as recently as five or six years ago now they're quite critical they really pour over this stuff I guarantee you the whole mood of the of the of the Biden C uh, exchange will be market moving will be strategy influencing um, in in boardrooms and I think that's that's quite profound that is quite a profound change all right on that note thank you. Charlotte, Steve, Sharon for joining Thank you, us. Jen. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Some positive signs coming out of the G20 summit, but clearly still a lot more to be done on moving forward on issues highlighted today.
Thank you for joining us on this special episode of Insight.